great to see all of you this morning. You know, there's two types of people that are here this morning. Those of us that have our lives together and those of us who don't. Yeah, and it's just that simple. It's just that simple. You know, if you're here this morning, you might be in a place where everything that seems to be going on in your life is just good. You know, you've got a good job. There's lots of health. Your kids are in a good place. Everything looks rosy. Your future looks awesome. You've got it all together. And when people look at you, you've got the car in the driveway, you've got the new stuff in your house, and everybody looks to you and goes, you know what, I think you've got it together. And they actually look to you and say, you know what, I kind of want to be like that person. And when we get into that place, we may, we may not turn to God. Now, the other type of person that could be here this morning is that life is pretty hard. You're in a situation right now where you just don't feel qualified to do the things that are in front of you. You might feel worthless. You might feel like there is nobody around you that supports you. You might be in this place where you're confused about what's coming next. What am I going to do? And you don't really have your life together. And I think for every one of us here, we're going to fall into one of those two categories. You either have your life together or you don't have your life together. And the thing about not having your life together is that we in the church often do this. We don't have our life together and we fake it. We don't let anyone know anything about what could be going on in our life. We started this series last week called Above All. And we're going through the book of Colossians, and we're just going to look at what God has called us to do and to be. Christ is above all, amen? amen. He needs to be in that place first in our lives. And if that's not happening, we are in for a rough ride. But how do we get there? Because if you're like me, I know my life is great. I'll just confess that right up front. My life is awesome. I love my life, but I have this tendency that maybe I, I don't have God above all all the time. Uh, you know what? I'll just skip devotions today. Uh, you know what? I'll just skip that time with my wife or my kids. You know what? I won't, I won't go to small group. Or, you know, we get into that habit so easily. But if we don't have our life together, we seem to not really figure out how to put it together. And you know what? The Word of God actually has an answer for us, and that's just pray. Just pray. I want you to turn with me over to Colossians chapter 1. And as Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae, he starts with his introduction, and then he gives this prayer. This prayer for all the saints that are in Colossae, but not just for them, but for us today to know how to actually pray when life doesn't seem to be going well, but also when life is going well. So let me read it for you this morning. And if you've got a Bible, please turn there. If you've got some kind of uh, uh, electronic device, just use that and, and follow along. And I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered you from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son whom, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So here's Paul as he's writing this letter and he's heard about their faith in Colossae. And he's immediately, he's like, we're praying for you. 
Because there's this thing that's happening in the world. You're either living a life that's honoring God where Jesus Christ is in first place, or you're not. And he's called us to be following him and have him in first place. So this morning, what do these prayers actually look like? And how do we have hope in the midst of these situations? And how do we have hope when we do have it all together? And how do we have hope when we're in these places of confusion and worthlessness? Well, there's four line items that uh, Paul prays for us, and we're going to talk about that this morning, about how do we actually pray to have hope so that we can just be living above all, all the time. So the first one is just this, to live above all, we pray, fill us with the knowledge of God's will. (laughs) So simple. Just asking God to fill us with the knowledge of God's will. It's right there in verse 9. If you're wanting to know some prayers to, to pray, these are great. Just unlo- underline them in your, in your Bible or highlight them in your, in your gadget. It says there that he's been asking that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Well, what's God's will? God's will is what God wants. God has a will. God has a plan. And as we are in a place where we are praying for the knowledge of his will, something happens to our confusion. You see, you and I have to make all kinds of decisions each and every day. But sometimes we don't actually know what to do in the midst of our decisions. And oftentimes we may go and ask for advice, and that's great. But do we actually ask God to fill us with the knowledge of his will? Because if you don't know what to do, that's the prayer that you need. And it's not only just the knowledge of his will, but with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And you know, many of us know so much information today, we can Google any kind of information we want, but do we know how to actually use the information that we have? You see, wisdom is about rightly applying knowledge, and it's spiritual wisdom. And so God says, you know what, I have all kinds of knowledge and I want to give it to you so that you know what my plan for your life is, what my will about any situation that you're in. And it's wisdom. It's not just knowledge, but it's rightly applying the knowledge of God to the situation that you and I are in. And when everything is going great, we don't really do that. And in fact, when everything is going great, what we normally do is we just rely on our own strength. We even say to God sometimes, maybe we don't say it just this way, but sometimes we have this attitude and we say, God, I got it together, it's okay. I don't need to know what you're doing. And then all of a sudden we get going in that place and God says, okay. You want to live in that place? You live in that place. And all of a sudden confusion comes in and we're like, how did we get here? Because I don't know what to do. And then it dawns on us, well, maybe I should pray. And we, get, we come back to this place and we just ask God, God, would you fill us with the knowledge of your will? And if you want to be living above all the circumstances that are in your life and living where Christ is the preeminent, he is seated in heavenly places and he is seated in the heavenly place of my heart, high on the throne of my heart, then I'm going to be constantly living in this place where I'm asking him, I'm praying constantly to be filled with the knowledge of his will. You see, this prayer of asking God to fill us with the knowledge of his will causes us to know his will for the situation. And I know what you're thinking. (laughs) How? How is this going to happen? And if you're like me, you've prayed about some pretty big decisions in your life. And you've struggled through them. I remember a time when I was going to university, and I didn't know what university God wanted me to go to. But here I am in this place knowing that I want to follow God, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. And at that time, I, kind of, I had all kinds of choices. And I didn't know, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and there was still nothing. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do, God? I remember lying in my bed one night, staring up at the ceiling, going, God, would you give me an answer? But you see, that process 
of asking God to know his will did something in me. It brought me to this place where I was ready to hear. And over a course of a few months as I prayed this, and I think sometimes we expectantly want God to tell us this information right away. But over the course of a few months, God just said, you know what? And, and, and it wasn't really an audible voice or anything. It was just like this, per, this uh, perception or this, uh, uh, this uh, just intuition on my heart. I need to do this. And I felt so much peace when I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I feel like God wants me to do this. And I felt so much peace about it. There was no more confusion. There was no more, I don't know what to do because I've been seeking the Lord for this. And now he is above all. He is first place. He is seated on the throne of my heart because I've been seeking him and asking for his direction. And my life is not confusing. And it's not all together either. But it's just following him. You see, when we get to this place of, of being able to, to seek the Lord and to know his will, we actually have all kinds of hope. We actually know more. We know the promise of God's word that speaks to this whole situation where if we follow him and we trust in his promises, that when we love him, the future looks better than yesterday. And we trust that. But we have to be praying these things so that we understand and know the knowledge of God's will so that we can have the knowledge, so that we can have the spiritual wisdom and the understanding that goes with following God. Because here's the thing, if that is not a constant prayer in your life, you are not going to be in this place where you're like, yeah, God, I'm just following you full on. You're going to be in this other place which is like, I got my life together, I don't really need God. Or maybe you'll be even in that other place which is like, you know what, I'm totally confused and I have no idea what's going on. Here's the second prayer that Paul prays for the church in Colossae. And you know, we so much need to take this into ourselves. The first one is to fill us with the knowledge of his will, but to also help us walk worthy of Jesus. You know, our walk is all about the things that we do each and every day. Our walk is our conduct. It's our manner of life. And it actually says that we would walk in a way, a, a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. You'll notice in ver verse 10 it says, walk in this manner. There's a manner of walking that relates to Jesus and he sees it as pleasing. Are you doing that? Do you even know? Because it goes on to say that we would be bearing fruit Bearing fruit in good works. Increasing in knowledge. Are you that type of person that is actually increasing in the knowledge of God? Are you that type of person, if we looked at your life and you truly, not everybody else looking at it, but you personally, truly looked at your life and you said, yes, I am bearing fruits of good works. And sometimes we look at our life and we don't see very many good works. Sometimes we look at our life and we see all kinds of good works and we get proud and arrogant other times we don't see any. And we kind of lose hope and we lose faith. That's why Paul is praying this for the church in Colossae. That's why we need to be praying it too. Help us walk worthy of Jesus. So how much fruit is in your life? Is it increasing? Is it growing? Because here's the thing. This actually matters to Jesus. Jesus cares a lot about the fruit that you're producing. And he wants you and I to be in this place where we're abounding in fruit. Because that's this place where Jesus is above all in our life. Where he is preeminent. He is seated above all all things and if he is seated above all things in our heart then we're going to be walking worthy of who he is and this is quite a challenge to us if you know yourself like i know myself there are times that i'm totally forgetting about who god is there are times when i'm really not thinking about 
what God wants me to do in this situation. Sometimes I'm just doing my thing. I'm walking in the flesh. And that might be a little bit, wow, your pastor just confessed that he at times walks in the flesh. Yeah. I did. That's why I'm praying, God, would you help us, help me walk worthy of Jesus. You see, this isn't about all of us having it all together on the outside and looking like things are going well. Because as soon as we get into this place, it's like, whoops, I just messed up. And you know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. We need to be living, praying, God, would you just help us? And you know, this offers so much hope to us. Because I know you're like me because you slip up. None of us are perfect. None of us get to this place where we're walking 100% of the time, fully engaged, walking with God. That's the goal, yes. And sometimes when we fall, we lose, we lose our hope. And we actually feel all kinds of feelings that make us feel worthless. And we're like, you know what, I can't get this right with God. God, I seem to fail at this every single time. Does my life even matter to you? And we fall into this trap of hopelessness and worthlessness. Well, the answer is start praying this. And not only for yourself, but for our church, for your family. Pray this for your family. God, would you help our family? Would you help my kids? Would you help my grandkids walk worthy of Jesus? If they proclaim the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that we would be walking and living and bearing fruit and increasing in knowledge because we're following Jesus. That's what it means to live above all things. To have Christ in this heart, place in our heart where we are totally engaged with him. Here's the third prayer that he mentions. To strengthen us with power. I think this is my favorite prayer. Verse 11, you'll notice in verse 11 it says, may you, so individualized, be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. How many of us are in that place where we just say, you know what, I, there is so much on my plate right now, I don't know if I could handle anything else. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're on the verge of burnout. And maybe it's work. Maybe it's the home life. Maybe it's just life in general. Maybe it's just everything. And you're just walking through life and you're exhausted. How many people know what I'm talking about? Yeah. This is the prayer for you. <laughs> Strengthen us, God, with power. And I love this phrase because it's not just with any power. It says all power with glory, the glorious might of his power. Whoa, what is that? It's the power that made the heavens and the earth. It's the power that holds the universe together. It's the power that God created things with. It's God's power that transcends any other power. And he says, strengthen us with that kind of power. Well, that sure changes my life, does it not? That sure changes the situation. If I'm in a situation where I'm exhausted, well, God, give me some of this power. And it's not because we're kind of rubbing the genie here to get the thing that we want, but this is God's promise to us. He says that if you have me, if I live inside of you and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you will have power to go and be my disciples. Isn't that what we all want? To be walking around through life having this power to tackle all of the things that come at us. All of the suffering, all of the problems, all of the, just the busyness of life. 
that we so easily get exhausted in the middle of. And you know what? It's just not any kind of power. It's this, it's an amazing power that comes with some benefits. I want you to notice as Paul is writing this, and, and I just love his heart here, because his heart is for the church, for the believers. And he says, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Hallelujah. The next time you get into a situation where you feel like you're just exhausted, God's like, just ask me for this power that gives you endurance, and not just with any kind of endurance, but it actually has patience and joy with it. You know, patience is one of the hardest things to do. I find it really hard. I'm standing in a line. I'm like, oh, what's that person? Stop talking and let's get done. Let's get the job done. We're going through a line here. Please, come on, hurry up. That's how I think. But it says patience. You know, the last time that you've been going through a difficult situation that's causing you to be exhausted, have you actually said, I wish this could be over? Because what we're actually saying there is we're getting exhausted and I don't know that I can endure this. But the power that God gives us is like, you know what, you can do this, you can get through this, and I'm going to give you the patience to do it. Because that's what comes with power. Now, is that awesome? Yes, it is. Are we praying for it? I'm not sure. And it's not only just patience, it's joy. Wait a second, what, you, what, what was Paul actually praying? Paul was praying that in their difficult, exhausting, tiredless situations, suffering trials, whatever it was, because he knew what they were going through, he had the update. He's saying, I'm praying for you so that you would be strengthened with all of this power so that you can get through this with patience and joy. Okay, I need some of that. I need some joy. And if you're ever in a situation where you're tired and exhausted, that's always the first thing that goes. You don't have joy. It's kind of like, oh, here I go again. You know what I'm talking about? We need to be praying this prayer. We need to be asking God to strengthen us with this power so that we can live through hardship so that we can live through sufferings. Because you know what? We all suffer at some time, but it's more than that. It's that we actually have the strength to get through the day-to-day -day stuff when, you know what, there's too much on my plate today. So what does that look like? Well, it just looks like this. You got too much on your plate? It's like, oh yeah, if I'm going to live above all the stuff that's on my plate right now, I just need to ask God, strengthen me with your power. And you know, as a church, we need to be praying that for each other. God, would you strengthen us as a church with this power to live above all the things that are going on in our world, the things that attack me daily, the things that bug me, the things that seem to drag me down. Would you give me that power? And you know, it's so much connected with hope because when we actually have this power working within us and we feel this strengthening that's just coming from nowhere and we're just kind of like, well, thank you, God, for this blessing. We actually have hope because we can get through the thing that's in front of us. Now, we may be sitting in a situation right now where we just kind of feel hopeless that the situation is not going to end. And we are tired. We are exhausted. And in those moments, we are losing, we're losing the hope that we have because of Christ seating himself on the throne. So let's pray. Let's pray. And you know, I don't think it's a coincidence in any of Paul's letters as he's introducing himself to these people that he knows and some of them he doesn't know. The first thing he does is pray for them. That's the first thing that we need to be doing. Praying for each other. Praying for the people in our small group. Here's the third, fourth one. If I'm going to live above 
all things. Not only do I need to be filled with the knowledge of Jesus and God's will and worthy of Jesus and strengthened with his power, but enlightened my mind and our mind to our inheritance. Now, I'm not talking about a physical inheritance that you're going to get from parents, possibly, or aunts and uncles or cousins. I'm talking about the inheritance that we have through Jesus. And Paul, at the end of this section, goes into this long dialogue and talking about what that actually looks like. You can read it with me in verse 12. And this is where, when we're praying, and, and, he's, and this, he's saying to these people, you know, we're praying for you and we're giving thanks because there's some things that are happening in your life. Verse 12, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Do you know what that means? Do you know how it affects your life? that you get to share in this inheritance of the saints. And I think a lot of times, our minds, we don't get this. We read that and it just sounds like a bunch of words and it kind of floats around in our head and we really can't sink our teeth into it and walk and live our life with those words. I want to draw your attention to the fact that all of that section is all past tense. He has qualified you. He has delivered you into the kingdom of his dear son. You know, we forget so easily that when we became followers of Jesus Christ and we knelt down on our knees or however we did it, but we bowed the knee to Jesus and we said, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against others. I am worthy of punishment. I am worthy of, of so much more, but you've offered me grace, and here I am. Would you forgive my sins, and would you welcome me into your family? When we did that, and if you've done that this morning, you are in this place where you have been qualified to receive this inheritance. You have been delivered from the domain of darkness, this kingdom of darkness, and you've been placed inside the kingdom of God. But if you haven't done that, you need to. You need to surrender your life to Jesus and ask him to set you free. Set you free from the blindness of really understanding your inheritance that God so much wants to give. And what Paul is saying here, do you really get what God has done for you? If he is the one that is preeminent, if he is the one that is above all things, if he is the one that is ruling and reigning, then what he says, what decisions he makes really matter. And we need to have our minds enlightened to those things. Because there's a, a problem for many of us Christians, even those of us who seem to have our lives together, at many times, we feel unqualified. We feel incredibly unqualified because we don't think we possess what we need. And I'm not even qualified to be in God's family because you know what? I walked in the flesh yesterday. And so we kind of erase and we walk away from that and we say, you know what? I'm, I, I don't know if I am really a part of God's family. And when we get in those places, in those moments, we need to pray this. We need to pray that God would enlighten our mind to our inheritance, our identity in who we really are. You see, God has blessed us with the information in the scriptures to know from the beginning what the end actually is. And this is our identity in Jesus. 
And it's so great. And you, you may be thinking, okay, Chris, I, I, I hear all of this, and I, and I get these four prayers, and, and you know what? Maybe I haven't been praying them all the time, but you know what? I really want to, but I just feel overwhelmed now because you've added one more thing to my list to do. Well, pray for strength. Because this is way more important than anything that you have on your plate. Anything. Because when we get following Jesus the way God really intends, all of these things just fall into place. And it's not like your life is together, but God's putting it together. Because he's using you, you're bearing fruit, you're doing all kinds of things. And this, this gives me so much hope. So much hope that I can actually be delivered from the domain of darkness. And transferred or translated, as it says in other translations, into the kingdom of God. And him buying the price that needed to be paid so that I could move from one place to another place. To live with him eternally and understand what it means to have forgiveness of sins. And family, we need to know those things so richly and so deeply that there's nothing that can rob us of the fact that we're his. But I think all too often we're not praying those things. We're just so busy in our life. We're in this place where, you know what, things are great, so I'll just set God off to the side. But when life gets a little bit hard, we sometimes don't pray these prayers either because we feel like God's not going to answer. The challenge for today is that we would pray. That we would not just pray for ourselves and our family, but we would pray for our church. That as Paul was writing this letter, he was not just writing it to Colossae and to the believers at Colossae, but that he was writing it to us today. That we would actually be engaged in praying and asking God to do these things that Paul was asking God to do for the believers in Colossae. Because he knows that it was needed. He knows that these people are struggling with worthlessness. They're struggling with feeling unqualified. They're struggling with not really knowing everything about who Jesus is. And we're no different. We're no different. So if you and I are going to live in this place where Jesus is high and exalted above all things, where he's preeminent, he's, the, he's sitting on the throne of my heart, and I'm passionately following him, I'm going after him, wherever he goes, I'm going, then we're going to pray like this. And for maybe some of us this morning, this is kind of a radical, a radical sermon. You've never really prayed like this before. It's been more like, well, Jesus, could you, you know, could you make my day go okay? Or Jesus, you know, um, uh, just, yeah, I don't know. And we stop our prayer there because we really don't know what to say to God. Well, here's four great prayers that we can say to Jesus that actually help us no matter where we are in, in our life situation. And I know some of us are in, in difficult spots. I know that. But pray. Pray. And as we pray for one another, this, this hope that is promised, this hope that is laid up in heaven for you, comes to, for, 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 to fulfillment. I love, <laughs> during our communion time, Andrew stole some of my notes. He used one of the scripture verses, and we didn't talk about it, but I just think that that's so much God, the whole, so much the Holy Spirit. He said during communion, all those who labor and are heavy laden come unto me. And that's my close. If you're here this morning and you're heavy laden and your burden is heavy, come to Jesus. You know, I love that promise because he says, 
my burden or my yoke is easy and it's light. Thank you, God, for that promise. Thank you for the promise that your yoke, when we get joined to you, when we're walking with you, life doesn't just become totally easy, but when we're walking with you, we are connected with you, and you make our life easy. You make our burden, our everyday life, light, because we're doing things like praying, asking God to fill us with the knowledge of his will, to have this walk that's worthy of Jesus, to strengthen us with power and enlighten our minds. Can we agree this morning to go from this place and live like that? Can we agree? Please say yes. Please say yes. Yes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning for your word the truth of your word and how it impacts us, but also the instruction of your word and how it teaches us how to live like you in the midst of our situations. God, I, I know today that there are those of us that are here that feel like we have our life together and we are not going to you in prayer because we're doing it all. God, I just pray that you would move and stir in our hearts so that we would pray that we would seek your face. And God, that you would be glorified in our life, that we would have this walk that is worthy of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, who gave his life to set us free. And God, for those of us who just know that our life is not together, but maybe we're trying to give this facade that it is together, that you have the answer that you give us everything we need through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So God, I pray today as we're moving forward through this series about just talking about having you above all, that you would be preeminent in our hearts, that we would just sort of set aside this time this week to actually pray and to pray these four prayers. And to not just do it for a couple of days, but to make it a part of our discipline, a part of our life, to just pray like this. And by doing that, God, that you would be above all, that you would be preeminent, and that you would be the Lord of our lives. So God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your truth. We pray, Lord, that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit to be who you created us to be. And we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.